I'm Tom Charles. I work at the Side Business School, um, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome Josh Levs here um, to the school to speak to you all tonight. He's an award-winning uh, investigative journalist, author, and leading advocate for gender equality in the workplace. His new book, which has this wonderful title, All In, How Our Work First Culture Fails Dads, Families, and Businesses, and How We Can All Fix It Together. I'm a dad, so I'm very interested in this topic. Um, has uh, been winning rave reviews from media, businesses, and gender equality groups, uh, such as UN Women. Um, the New York Times has described as fantastic. The Financial Times has named uh, Josh as one of the top male feminists. Uh, <laughs> the book zeroes in on how men can join with women to eradicate the structures maintaining sexism in the workplace. Lev explains that modern dads have just as much to gain and lays out clear steps for men and women to take together. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Josh. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So it's already evening. I like to, uh, I'm going to start off with something fun, a little bit of uh, video. But first of all, I'll just set the stage for you. So I have learned that I am in a unique position to be able to explain to you all a few things. One is the, the surprising and weird quirks of how business works in the United States, um, and why businesses in the superpower are so far behind the rest of the world in, in a major way when it comes to uh, recognizing the importance of, of family and bringing family and, and business together, making them work together. Um, but I've also done a lot of research about other countries. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present to you a little bit of both, but uh, especially a look at the weirdness of the U.S. because that is where my story comes from. But then now uh, we're going to open it up and we'll talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. All right. But let's start off with this fun thing. It's, uh, it's from a, a network that... Um, is part of the CNN family in the United States. This network is called HLN. Oh, by the way, I like to be uh, like very unofficial the way I do this. You're going to see me jump around in my computer. That way, if you ask a question, I want to show you a website, I can do it, or I can say, hey, let's all tweet this thing. Um, so this is, uh, this is a segment that I did on HLN. Being a dad, I just love this story. And, and thankfully, some dads took action. Basically, what do they want for Father's Day? Uh, for the media to stop portraying dads as buffoons. Doofus dads, right? I mean, like, that's all we ever see. It's not just one or two shows. It's practically every show. And Josh Levs joins us now. And Josh, yeah. you and I are both dads. You've got little ones. i got yeah. teenagers. And enough's enough. And I love it that some dads stood up. It's so true, isn't it? You, you, almost, you can't avoid the caricature of us as dads as being these complete idiots who can't understand how to do anything. Nothing. Often who don't know how to take care of We're our We're practically another kid in the home in most TV shows. But just so everyone knows, this isn't, this isn't a wine session. I mean, what, what's so interesting <laughs> to me is that dads are doing something about this yeah. now. They're standing up and fighting, and I, I have some proof that they're making a difference. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start off with an ad that aired earlier this year that was just obviously offensive. Take a look here. To prove Huggies diapers and wipes can handle anything, we put them to the toughest test imaginable. Dads, alone with their babies, in one house for five days. Okay, so in that ad, Huggy said the, the 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 biggest test imaginable is to, for diapers is to leave kids we alone can't with dads. Oh, right? of course not. Ew, gross, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just amazing. Okay, they had another one where the dads didn't change the diapers throughout an entire game on double overtime. So what happened here is a bunch of dads got together. They started petitioning online. That one guy started a petition. A lot of people complained online. Huggies took it really seriously. They jumped on it. They said, "Whoa, this was not what we meant." They called one of the dads. They pulled two ads. They replaced them with brand new ads. And here's one of the new ones. Take Awesome. To prove Huggies wipes can handle anything, we asked real dads to put them to the test with their own babies on spaghetti night. Totally different message there. We asked dads to put them to the test. And you see this happening elsewhere dad's as well. Dad's cooking as well. Dad's He's preparing cooking, a meal. Dad's feeding. And so I started to talk to some pop culture analysts. You don't need my pop culture analysis. I'm going to stop it there. Okay. So um, the kind of change that you saw in that ad there is actually speaking to something that's going on all over the world and in many countries. And if you watch the evolution of advertising and the way that men are represented in advertising, you're going to start to see these changes. This stereotypical images of dads as incapable have been popular in many, many places. And steadily they're changing. And the reason that this matters. See, it used to be I would talk about this on CNN or I would write a column about it and people would write me and say, come on, loosen up, relax. You know, it's entertainment. It makes fun of everybody. Everybody gets caricatured. But what they didn't understand was this is a symptom of something real. And this something real is having very serious consequences that go far, far beyond that. There's this 
there's this illness at the core of our structures, certainly in the U.S., and that's why I call this a secret reality that's hurting businesses and blocking gender equality. The ads are one symptom, but by far we have worse symptoms. One of them is this right here. This is what's going on with uh, women in the United States. The U.S. is not alone. The percentage of red shows women in the, in the workforce. So women are entering at about half the workforce, and when you get up to CEO level, the women are gone. All right? So less than 5% of the CEOs in the S&P 500, this, this massive index, are women. That is another symptom of this same problem, which I'm going to tell you about. But that's not even the worst symptom. This is the worst symptom. We, oh, by the way, let me show you this. So um, this shows uh, the fact that women are, in many countries, getting to higher levels in senior management. But, and you might be exposed to this sometimes. And it is a sign that things are getting better. You do see these numbers coming up. However, there's two things to know about this. One is, first of all, you can see how far the United States is behind many other countries. But two, even still, even when you see these senior management figures, getting to the very, very top of the companies, getting to that CEO level happens much more rarely than the other senior level management. Because sometimes what you'll have is 10 vice presidents, and they make sure to give one of those VPs slots to a woman, so they're able to say, we have a woman senior manager. The problem is, in a great many cases, those very top CEO level positions, and CXO in general, are tough to get to. But this is the worst symptom. This is the worst symptom, and it's one that I experienced directly. Um, the United States is the only country that does not make sure that when a baby is born, it can have a parent at home and food on the table for at least a block of weeks. It's incredible. With this massive economy, there's no structure there at all to make sure that you can stay home, take care of your child, and feed your child. And this is something that I learned directly, and this is where my case comes from, and this is how my case led to all this global attention and how I went on to learn so much. I could not care for my four pound preemie daughter, the one some of you were in here early, so you saw that picture of her, there's two now, um, when she was born, uh, uh, preemie. I could not stay home and care for her or for my very sick wife or for my two boys. This is the worst symptom of the same problem. The ads that slam men and dads as a group women not working their way up the workforce, and this anywhere you see it in the world, these things are intertwined. They all come from one place. And the place that they come from is the way that business was created. And that's in the United States. But unfortunately, these problems in some other ways also exist elsewhere. Um, I put this screen here called innovation because this is the thing I want you all to know because you're business students, right? Um, most of you, all of you probably? OK, cool. So um, ever since I was little, I have loved business. And I've been fascinated by it. My grandfather had this tiny little shop at the edge of his driveway. And I used to love watching him. And if he could get an extra penny for an item, I was so excited for him. It was so cool. So I grew up understanding that a business's ability to succeed, the ability for any person to create a business and start selling a product, is a way of taking the temperature of society. And as I've traveled around the world, and I've done reporting, reported from Germany, I reported from Australia, anywhere I go, one of the things I do is I talk to shop owners. Because I want to know, what's it like? Are they able to get an idea, create a business, no matter what your race, your gender, your religion, anything about your background? Do you have a shot at doing this? And the reason it means so much to me is that I think that business is the spark of humanity. This is the story of what we are. This is what we do. We create stuff. That's why we're the species that runs the Earth. We create buildings, we create universities, we create these kinds of screens, we create life-saving medicines and vaccines. And so when I see businesses operating, looking for better ways to do things, to me, that's the spark of humanity. And you're going to see how all these things I'm talking about fit together. So I started looking at all this when I was a reporter. When I report on uh, radio, I get to dress like that all I want, which is awesome. Um, I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States. And so I've covered big businesses. I've covered Coca-Cola. I've covered Delta Airlines. There, uh, you see a picture there from Sydney, Australia, one of the places I reported. After doing a lot of years at NPR, covering businesses, covering economies, traveling around the world, I jumped over to CNN. And at CNN, the what main thing I wanted to do was be a fact checker. I got really into fact checking because this happens on TV news all over the world, and it's the worst thing about live TV news. Pundits and politicians get on the air, and they literally say anything they want. And very often, there's no one there to go back and tell you what was true and what wasn't. 
So the, the bare bones basics of what journalism is supposed to be very often, sadly, isn't happening in live TV. So I wanted to be this, this uber fact checker and look at the economy and look at um, businesses, look at all these issues, look at what the claims were during presidential races. And uh, so they gave me a shot and then I started wearing my glasses on TV and suddenly they put me on TV a lot more because they, they thought the glasses thing made me look smarter or whatever. So I played the system. Suddenly I was this like geek guy who got to come on the air and say facts and they would actually say like, oh, get Lev's, he has the glasses, go put him on. So I started learning through this process how incredibly many facts get lost in conversations about every issue. And I started learning how to understand things like looking at studies, the kinds of things that you guys probably do here. Looking at studies, looking at actual hard figures, figuring out what's the truth and what's not the truth, understanding survey methodologies, all the things that I have to do to understand reality and to get past the noise that surrounds issues. So here I am looking at all this, studying facts, and then throughout all this I become a father. Now, becoming a parent is always dramatic in any situation, but for my family it was especially dramatic. This is my first son. Uh, when he was two days old, we found out that he had to have major heart surgery. So here he is at seven days. I like pointing this out because, yes, it's horrifying and a nightmare, but this is also beautiful because this is innovation. This is the story of humanity. This is what we do, and check it out. Here he is a year later, completely healthy. The scar is totally gone. So I got this crash course in parental responsibility, this crash course in what it is to worry, but also what it is to accept that there are some things you cannot control. And it was no question to me that, as a dad, being a parent is number one. But the, the reaction that I had is the same reaction that a lot of guys have, a lot of people, but especially a lot of guys, which was I suddenly got obsessed with making money and working, working, working and getting money. I'd never cared that much about money and now all of a sudden I had a kid and he was gonna have a future and someday he's gonna have college and how stable are we gonna be? And everything in my mind changed. And then I started overworking, which was really unhealthy. I would work so, or, oh, by the way, that's when I learned to like Red Bull, which you should probably not try because once you, once you start, you don't go back. Um, I, uh, I, uh, I was working too much. And then came child number two, which knocked me out of that because in my family, as I said, we never have normal birth. Um, with my second child, uh, he and my wife conspired to skip labor altogether. My, uh, my wife was pregnant, this was three weeks before her due date, and suddenly she fell to the floor of our bedroom and stuff started coming out into my hands and then I saw the baby's head and then he came out into my hands. When he came out at first, uh, his eyes were shut and he was, um, there was no sign that he was breathing. And then I saw the umbilical cord was tangled around his neck five times. Um, so, I don't always do this, but uh, I'm going to now. I have a little clip of my, in the United States we call it our 911 call. It's the, uh, the emergency call that I made right then, because this ultimately had a profound effect on me. <laughs> and uh, it's something that uh, is worth sharing. Here's a little clip of my 911 call. More than a year later, after he was fine, I shared a bit of this on the air. That day, they were contacting me. They were like, CNN was like, okay, when are you gonna come talk about this on the air? Do you have video? Do you have pictures? Of course I do not. But uh, more than a year later, we did uh, share this, this little she bit. She knows all the steps very well, and she knows what the feelings would be. This is incredibly unusual, but it happened to her. So she's down on the floor and says, call an ambulance. I get on the phone with 911. Here's a little clip of what happened. What do I do? I'm holding my baby's head. Okay, listen, I want you to support the shoulders. Okay. And hold the hips and legs firmly. Okay. And remember, the baby will be slippery, so don't drop it, okay? Okay. Okay, so is the baby completely out of just a head? No, just a head. I'm seeing okay. a head. It's okay. scrunched up. Let me, let him. But it's not crying. It's not making noise. Its eyes are shut. Okay, have her to push hard and get the baby out, okay? Push hard, get the baby out. Push hard, push hard. Oh my God, I'm holding my baby. <laughs> Right. Cord and someone wrapped around his neck, I'm taking okay. it off. Okay, listen, Jim, gently wash the baby's mouth and nose. Oh, okay. It's choking, it's choking okay, on the cord. Uh, breathe, baby, breathe. Breathe, baby, breathe. I'm going to leave the cord off. Let me give you a CPR instruction for the baby, okay? Oh, the baby's breathing. Is the baby breathing? Yes, it's breathing. All right, now, may, by the way, I don't want to traumatize you all. This is not going to happen to you, trust me. <laughs> The weird stuff that should never happen in birth only happens to me and my family so that you will, so we can be the exceptions, so you guys will never have to deal with any of this. This doesn't happen. Um, literally, like less than one in a million. That literally does not happen to almost anyone. So um, the effect that it had on me is really important for you to understand, and that is that in that moment, I got such a reality check because in the moment, in that experience, I, it was so clear what matters most in life was being there for those moments and having these connections. And so the thought of missing a lot of those moments because of overworking uh, no longer made sense. So I started looking for work-life balance. 
which is why I'm here for this conference, and this is how uh, I got so interested in this issue. So I started talking to dads and interviewing dads about all sorts of things, like work-life balance, and I started doing segments on the air about this. And the responses that we got, we aired them domestically on CNN, and we aired them internationally on CNN. And the responses that I got from both inside the United States and around the world were ridiculously huge. They shouldn't have been this big. All these people started contacting me and saying, I've never seen anything like this. All I was doing, this was not one of the harder journalistic assignments. I had just said, hey, let's get a bunch of dads together and do stories. So here's a few of them. We, this became the number one thing on the CNN newsroom blog. I heard from other media wanting to interview me about being a dad who interviews other dads. It was this very strange, self-reflective, meta experience. And that's when I realized why it was such a big deal to people was because all they were ever seeing were those stereotypes that I showed you at the beginning. So having men sit and talk about actual things like stresses about money, and some of them were stay-at-home dads, and how we actually do want equal opportunities for our daughters and our sons, and the things that scare us, and the things that excite us. Having real conversations that did not speak to that old machismo was this new idea to a lot of people. So as a result of this, I started doing a lot more of it, and I uh, became a columnist for, on CNN about fatherhood, and I did a lot of segments like you saw on air about all that. Then came baby number three, which brings us to the book, which brings us to this big business issue. So we were like, okay, baby number three is going to be drama free. We're going to, it's all going to work out just right. Of course it did not. Um, I was under this very strange policy at CNN. It didn't make any sense. Under the policy that I faced, anyone could get 10 paid weeks to care for their new child except a man who impregnated his own wife. And that's literally, I have to say it that way, because that's literally how it was. If I gave up my daughter for adoption and another guy adopted her from my company, he could get 10 paid weeks to be home with her. If there was a surrogate involved, I could get 10 paid weeks. If I had a same-sex domestic partner and he adopted a baby, but I did not co-adopt the baby, I could still get 10 paid weeks to care for his baby. But I, the real me, I couldn't. So clearly this made no sense. So I went to the benefits department at work and I said, look, there's no way you intended this. There's no way that you meant to exclude the possibility that a typical dad in a traditional scenario is the only person who can never be the caregiver. But they wouldn't give me an answer. And months went by, no answer. And then, because it's my family, uh, my wife went in for her 35-week appointment, and she had very scary symptoms from preeclampsia, so they had to induce right then. And while, and again, this won't happen to you. It's, uh, so, so there I am in the room, messaging work, saying, hey, I got to know, am I about to have 10 weeks off or not? Still no answer. So 11 days later, I'm home holding my four-pound preemie. Um, four pounds, you can imagine. It was li she was literally like a doll and uh, caring for my sick wife and my two boys and messaging work. Am I going back to work now or no? And that's when they said no to getting the benefit. So everything else is in the book. And there's just two things I want you to know. One is that when I announced that I was going to take legal action against this policy, the responses that we got from all over the world blew me away. And so as a journalist, it was like going through that whole thing again when I had started covering dads. I didn't think it was that big a deal. I was taking legal action. I figured there would be some people who found it interesting. But it became too interesting. It shouldn't have been this unusual. So here, this was the front page of the New York Times business section. We have all these national shows. There was the global media were contacting me. I was hearing from media in India and Australia. Even recently, I've heard that they were just telling my story on global Korean language news. Like, this keeps happening. So as a journalist, I became fascinated. What is it about this experience for my family that is galvanizing so many people? And that's when I came to understand that we are all in and that people all over the world are facing this. Those of us who truly want gender equality for our daughters and our sons, for our wives and our husbands and for ourselves, those of us who really want it, we are up against this. This is the untold part, one of the most, one of the biggest untold parts of the fight for true gender equality in the world right now, and that is the fact that many, many, many men out there are like me. The tendency a lot of people have at first is to say, well, the guys I work with aren't like you. You're the exception. This is why I get to, this is why I pointed out to you that I'm obsessed with facts. I'm obsessed with real methodologies and reality checking things. What I did when I dug into this is I started looking, about, looking at the facts about dads in the United States and elsewhere. And we are far more committed to our families than most people realize. But many men live in these societies in which they can't talk about it. So men are struggling in the shadows because there's this machismo belief that we don't need to be home with our families. But if you bring that out into the open, it's a tremendous opportunity. 
because there are more and more men than anyone has realized who want to fight for gender equality. And this is what I was talking about last night, in case any of you uh, were there for that. That's where this book comes from. And that's where I got to really go exploring and find all this amazing news. And when I gave guys a safe space to open up about what they're struggling with, they all told the exact same stories. And they all said they had never told it before. They knew that they could because they watched me. So I had already known, before, even before I started the writing process, as soon as I announced my case, people started writing to me from around the world, men, telling me their stories. And they're way worse than mine. They're heartbreaking, these families. And what it's doing to families is so backward. But these structures come from somewhere. And in the United States, the place they come from is this. Does anyone know what this is, Mad Men? So you all know Mad Men? OK, cool. I, I have like a, it's this TV show that's super popular. Um, in the US, this actually is depicting the, uh, the modern economy that was created in the 1950s. And a lot of countries have had this. And you know, it's important to keep in mind. So the, the, with the US, what happened was we were coming out of the war. We were creating a new economy. And this idea of what it is to be successful was based entirely on gender. Success was the man is at work all the time and has the wife and kids who are at home all the time. That was this new vision of success. And that's really when it got drilled in. But it's not just the United States that has this. There's a reason that this started to catch on. But it is this basic core idea that work-life balance should exist. That's what people believed in the 1950s. That's still what a lot of cultures believe. It should exist. And the way to have work-life balance is that the man stays at work all the time and the woman stays home all the time, and then you got your balance. This idea that's behind this Mad Men era, which everything was gendered, this is where all of these problems come from. And this is why they all fit together. So suddenly, everything made sense to me. All right, good. You've seen this before, so I don't have to show you that obnoxious clip. We have this network of laws and policies and stigmas that act as gender police that, to this day, are pushing men to stay home, pushing women to stay at work, taking away opportunities, taking away options. So this, <laughs> this map is great. The countries, and I'm being generous with the S, the countries in dark red are the ones that don't have any paid parental leave at all, even for, for women. So basically, it's the United States. It's just us in Papua New Guinea and Suriname. But people complain about this a lot. But, but all of a sudden, it makes sense. Once you understand where all of this comes from, it totally makes sense. Of course we don't have any paid maternity leave system. She's a woman. She's supposed to stay home. Who needs her money? Same reason we don't have paternity leave, because he's a man. He's supposed to stay at work. That's what men do. That's what men are. And that way of thinking has withstood so much. You know, I, I went to, I went to, I grew up believing true gender equality. The girls I knew were just as smart and capable and driven. Then I went to Yale, so I'm surrounded by these brilliant women also. It seems so obvious that gender equality was real, that it would actually exist. The problem is, you're going to find this. You go out into society, and all of a sudden, you're facing these structures that did not grow up. They did not grow up with the belief that you have. And it is incredible. It's this amazing dichotomy. The difference between what's going on with families in many cultures and the way that cultures are still set up, especially with these stigmas, are incredibly powerful. These countries show what options are. right? And here's paternity leave. Um, and the darker means that the more paternity leave, basically. But here's what this map doesn't show. This is what's allowed. In very many countries, the overwhelming majority of available paternity leave goes unused. In most countries. For example, in Canada, which has a much, much better policy than the United States, 90% of the available paternity leave is never used. In fact, in most countries that have it, you find the same thing. Guys might get six, seven weeks of paternity leave. They might take maybe one. And the reason is that that idea is still there. These stigmas are very powerful. The stigmas are, in fact, more powerful than laws, more powerful than policies. In the US, this is what we have. More than half of companies say they have maternity leave, but they're really only paying you as a woman for your time off physically recovering. They're not actually giving you any money to ha be home for a while with your child. And only 14% of companies have any paid paternity leave. The amount offered has actually been going down. So despite the word that we hear about more and more companies doing the right thing, overall, things are getting even worse. And uh, this is a quote from my book. HarperCollins was great. They made a bunch of these graphics. Men face derision, demotions, even loss of their jobs when they make family a priority. And this is proven. There are so many stories about men who decided to buck the system, decided to take time off, decided to say, I need a flexible schedule, whichever it is, to really commit to family. And they were punished for it directly. 
There's one guy in my book who was told that he could not have the unpaid time that he's legally entitled to. He couldn't have it because women are supposed to take care of kids unless they're in a coma or dead. And that was a female boss. So there are some women who believe this as well. In a lot of the power structure is men, but there are women also who, as the experts say, explain in the book, who have the same belief. They say, well, I'm a woman, I'll take time off, but you're a man, why would you do that? So the extent to which this is still present is, is huge. What I get to do in the book is prove facts that totally conflict with this backward image of dads. And this is what dads in the US are like. We spend three hours a day on a work day with our kids. Virtually all of us who live with our kids care for them in every category, every day, or at least several days a week. And men are suffering from work-life conflict, as much as or even more than women. And this is not just, let's skip this, this is not just um, for, uh, 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 for, for men and women. And uh, you know what, let's look at that, even though it looks funny with the US split. Um, there's a brain drain going on. And this was a global study, and it's really interesting. For US men, they found men are even more likely than women to change jobs or careers, give up promotions, take pay cuts, move to be near family, or move to countries with better paternal leave, better, better parental leave policies, even more likely than women. This is the extent to which it's affecting men. So what you have is a lot of men leaving businesses, which I show. Meanwhile, most working women who stop their careers after a birth say the central reason is that their husbands had to keep working. So a lot of women are leaving their businesses because their husbands didn't have a choice. A lot of men are giving up their current jobs because their current jobs are not good enough for them because they are not able to truly be dads. So what we have is brain drain. And I love this picture from Wikigender because that's ultimately what it is. Companies are losing great minds. And these backward ways of thinking are really bad for business. The way a business succeeds is to have the best minds in the right jobs. It's so obvious. So sometimes the best person for a job is going to be a woman, obviously. But structures that still exist, including these stigmas that exist all over the world, are a big part of what's taking that away. Pushing more women to stay home, pushing more men to stay at work. And that hurts business because they're not able to hold on to the best people. Parents are taking career breaks after having kids. This one's a U.S. figure. 50% of U.S. women, 22% of U.S. men. So more and more men are also taking time off. They're leaving their businesses because they cannot get what they need. And this means that businesses are losing good employees, and it can be incredibly expensive to replace them. Um, th I don't expect you to memorize any of these figures, by the way. I'm just tossing them at you so you get the general idea. But it can be incredibly expensive. Worldwide, this is what we now know. through this great international study that was just recently conducted. This is this year. Most dads wish to work less for more time with their children. They admitted this in a survey, and in many cases, their own families didn't know this because they never told them. The figures range from 61% in Croatia to 77% in Chile. That's want more time off. They want more of this balance. And if we can harness that, all of a sudden we get to change the structures that are holding back women as well. But the ways that these stigmas play out are incredible. The State of the World's Fathers report, another report that came out this year, found that some women worry that men involved at home will be labeled as enslaved or bewitched. That's how bad it gets. So what you find is when you look at these different cultures, these same ideas that it's not manly to be a caregiver, they play out in different ways, but the result ends up being the same thing. More and more men staying at work all the time for more and more hours, more and more women not then having choices. So counteracting these stigmas in a big way is really important, and that's why speaking out about it. Like the guys that I got to interview for this book, the guys I put on the air, that's why something that's just so simple and basic, men talking about how we actually do care about everything, is suddenly revolutionary. Because this still exists. And these countries, I, actually the, uh, the bewitched thing was uh, in Rwanda and one other country, I believe, as well. These global stigmas are still very strong, but steadily they are changing. Ending anti-dad mess is crucial. This is what we have to do to improve the economy, because we have to open up opportunities for all of us. And when you start doing that, when you stop uh, sending out these fake messages, like real men don't care for their kids, real men can't handle, handle the diapers, when you stop those messages and you start embracing in pop culture these images of dads as actually caring for our kids and doing well with the diapers and enjoying being dads, suddenly these myths start to go away. And so does the pressure to avoid admitting in the workplace that you care about this stuff. This is a myth that dads are lazy at home. By the way, I feel bad using that picture, but it was a public domain image, so I took it. For all I know, that's a hardworking guy who's great. But um, 
There's a myth that dads are lazy at home. That's the US figure. Every time I see this myth, this is what I want to do. It is totally disproven by the facts. There's a, a global, one of the women I interviewed who's extremely famous, and uh, she believes this. She told me, and she's good in other ways on gender equality, but she told me, did you know that men all over the world spend more time in leisure than women do? It's a popular myth. And this is a good example of what I was able to fact check. The OECD says this, the Organization for Economic Cooperative Development. They looked at all these countries and look at these, this chart. I mean, all these men are getting more leisure time. This shows how much more they're getting in all these different countries. And it feeds this idea that men are coming home and kicking back and women really do everything at home. And that feeds the sexist structure. Because if guys aren't really doing anything, why would you possibly give them paternity leave? They're not going to do anything anyway. They're going to hang out, wait till their wives get home to do everything. But check it out. OECD, same organization, also says this. Time devoted to leisure is roughly the same for men and women. This is the kind of stuff that I ran into when I'm doing fact checking. How can the OECD say both? Women are getting so much less leisure time. No, wait, they're all getting the same amount of leisure time. This is what you have to do when you want to understand what's really going on. No one ever looks at small print. There are these tiny words down there that are covered by my thing now. But it says the narrow definition of leisure is being used. So what they did not do when they did this way, well, they didn't look at sleep. So there's a study that found that when a lot of these cases, what's happening is the men who are interviewed are breaking down what their day is like, and they're listing 20 more minutes as being for leisure or sports. But no one's mentioning that in a lot of these cases, women are listing 20 more minutes as being for sleep, which knocks this out. Or in some cases, what you have is uh, shopping. That there are these studies that show that um, women more often might do a few hours of shopping, and that's listed as work. But the, an hour of that might have been lunch with friends, and it's still listed as shopping. Oh, anyway, it's a big mess what happens in these surveys. But the OECD made an important statement when they said this. This idea that men are inherently lazy, that we're not pulling through, this makes life tougher for my daughter. This is sexism against women. This is not sexism against men. This image that people keep propagating, that guys aren't pulling our weight, is the force behind the stigmas. Guys don't do anything at home. Guys aren't actually cooking and cleaning and doing anything else. Of course not. That all falls to women. So I see this, and it's painful, because I know how wrong it is. And by the way, I'm just going to mention this one to you guys, and then I'll tie up, because I want to get to what you want to talk about. This is hilarious, and it's just so stupid. New York Times did a front page on their magazine, which is huge in journalism. They, they did this study that said that guys who <laughs> cook and clean get less sex. And the argument they were using was that they said it, it's a turnoff to women. That, we, that women like the idea of guys being equal, except it kind of turns them off because we're not traditionally macho. And that's really what they want to see. So this got huge play all over the world. And it was just straight up false. It was a misreading of an ancient study from the 1990s. And even if you read that, it was just sex one time more per month. But they still got it wrong. So I get to use the book and use this platform now that I have to go around talking about actual facts that surprise people that so conflict with what we all thought that a lot of people are still resistant at first. They say, wait, no, there's no way. There's no way. It has to be true. Men have to be more lazy. They have to be because men don't really do anything at home. The good news is that there are solutions for all this stuff. And in the United States, the solution is something called paid family leave that exists in three states right now. It should not be up to businesses to solve this stuff in general. So what we have in, in the United States now is three states have gone ahead and they said, we need our own solution because there's nothing national. So what they're doing now in the States is creating a statewide fund. And when you need paid family leave, not just to care for kids, to care for elderly parents, to care for a spouse, to care for anyone, you get that time off. It's working out incredibly well. What we need to do is make that national. But globally, what we have are some interesting things called father's quotas. Anyone here heard of father's quotas? All right, you guys have heard. Any of you from these countries? You are? <laughs> Do you have kids yet? No. But you have citizenship. Yeah. You're going to get the quota. Yeah. All right, so here, <laughs> this was controversial at first, so you probably know about this. So the way it works in a lot of countries is, and the reason that men aren't using our, our paternity leave is that you don't have to. In a lot of these countries, it's up to the parents. So there'll be like a block of time, and the parents get to decide how much they, they use. And because of the stigmas, men aren't using it. So you're propagating these old structures. But what these the countries did, it was controversial, but they're all jumping up. Did you know they're jumping up in 2016? Three months in Sweden, Iceland's going to have five months. What they did is they made, there's a block of time available to families, but separately there's a block of time available only to men. And this has flipped culture in ways that no one has ever seen before. Because the stigma, if you get a couple weeks, or if your family gets a choice, 
then um, you might, because the stigma is decide to stay at work and let the woman do the womanly thing in the typical way. But when there's such a substantial block of time available only to men, you look like an idiot for not taking it. Right? I mean, this is what the analysts are saying. So what's been happening is, when there's that much time, more and more men are staying home. And the number of men taking up their time jumped from something incredible, from like 12 to 15% in these countries, up to in the 80s, up to close to 90% in some of these countries. And all of a sudden, that's helping change the whole structure. Now, this is not something that would work for the US. Every country has its own relationship with taxes. The US has, as you may know, a very different relationship with taxes. The word tax is considered a very, very, very bad word in the US. But this is working in some of these countries. And so what we are seeing is this quota idea starting to take off. And what it does is it proves that these stigmas really are global. Because all of a sudden, when you give this, the guys show that, you know what, they really do want to take it. And when you do this at the beginning of a child's life, it creates a more egalitarian life for the child all the way through. I'll end with this. You guys are, uh, you guys are millennials. This picture is a little too stylized. It's kind of obnoxious. I don't love it, but it was public domain. It's the only one I could use. Um, so do you guys say millennials here? You do, right? Do you guys use that term? All right. So here's the thing. Millennials are, fortunately, in many countries, especially many Western nations, starting to look for balance and starting to expect balance. And when you're going into jobs, more and more young people are starting to say, OK, I want to know, am I going to be able to have a whole life? It's not just about having kids. It's about you might really want to go surfing. Well, we're, not, we're here. You're probably not going to go surfing. But you might want to you know, do, do some sport twice a week or whatever it is. You want to have the respect from the place you work that just because you work for them doesn't mean they own your entire life and doesn't mean that you don't get to have a life. More and more young people are insisting on that. And that's a tremendous opportunity. Because what we all forget in the workforce is that as workers, we are in demand. There's a supply and demand factor for us as workers. We have rights. The only thing I did that made people make such a big deal of my case was I exercised my rights. Ultimately, that's why so many people were contacting me from the media around the world. Why, why are you, they just they weren't used to hearing about a person exercising his rights, especially a man, especially a father. I'm no different from anybody else. I just exercised my rights. That's the only distinction. So if you keep in mind that you are wanted, that you are needed, that as workers, businesses should be coming to you and saying, hey, what can we do to make you happy? All of a sudden, you start looking for these things. And I recommend that you start looking very early on, because you will run into what I ran into. You're young. You expect things to be different. You get out there. You discover that these structures and stigmas are still very strong in most of the world, if not all of it. So you do have to face that down, and you do have to be prepared for it early on. And um, I'll end with this. Uh, think about what your first dream was. Not your first overnight dream. Your first, your first aspirational dream, when you thought about what you wanted to do with your life and what you want to experience, your first dream. When I ask people this, a lot of the time they say, you know, I wanted to be a, a movie star or an astronaut or a, a ballet dancer. But they're wrong. We forget this. The first dream that we all had was the same one. It was to be held and loved. You look into the eyes of any baby and you know this. But it's, that dream is literally primal. It's the first experience we had. It's the first thing we dreamed. And it's so deep inside us that we don't even think twice about it. We're not even aware of it. Hey, baby. <laughs> See, that's the ultimate dream right there. So to me, I said earlier, the story of humanity is that we adapt to survive. But I kind of lied. I think the story of humanity is two things. One is that we adapt to survive, innovation. But two is that we put it together with that. We put it together with living the ultimate dream. And this can come in any way. Loving what you do, loving your romantic partner, taking care of your parents whom you love, whatever it is, having love and connection in your life. That's the ultimate dream. It's the first one we ever felt. So since you guys are the business leaders of tomorrow, I want to ask you, implore you, <laughs> as you move forward, to keep this equation in mind. Innovation and prizing that first dream. That's what it is to be all in. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me tonight. All right. I